shortly after the coconut oil fake news came out in the middle of June of 2017, I was sent an email by a colleague friend of mine who wanted to know if olive oil is, is evil. I guess uh, it prompted him to look around and he found this uh, bit by, 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 by the Pritikin organization. So this was not their, their, their argument against coconut oil recently, but you, you can imagine. Coconut oil, Pritikin diets, low fat, so really anything fat they're, they're opposed to. And they jump on the saturated fats going to kill you bandwagon. LDL is bad for you. Does never explain why actually improperly. So this was what was the article that I linked to in the middle of, of June. Olive oil nutrition. What's wrong with olive oil? This is what my friend sent me. So I mean, these are not. This is not the way to look at <laughs> at food consumption. To target individual foods. I mean, this poor thing here, right? Now she's going to be scared of having olive oil, really? Okay, so let's go to the recent American, Associ American Heart Association article, the same one that got the whole coconut oil frenzy going. And let's look what they say about olive oil. The seven-country study, which was uh, Ansel Keys' work that got the whole lipid heart disease hypothesis cranking strong in the middle of the 1900s. <laughs> that sounds so long ago now. The seven countries study killed an interest in Mediterranean diet. Total fat intake was 43%. This varied depending upon the way you looked at it. I'll show you in a couple seconds. 43% total of total fat intake, I'm sorry, percent by calories. So 100% calories, 43% fat, most from olive oil. Turns out prevalence of heart disease was lowest worldwide there. So everyone jumped on the bandwagon. Got to take in more olive oil. Now look at what else, of course, they did there. Uh, vegetables, legumes, nuts, fruits, grain, whole grains, and fish. So if you eat those calorie sources and you eat them at the appropriate caloric intake levels, you'll be deflamed and just like a Crete person. Eating this much fat, big deal. No big deal. But people just, people in, a, people in America in particular who cannot get over the whole fat, propaganda can handle this and you'll see that that is the case uh, with this with this Pritikin article now, I don't know if that article the Pritikin article was recent or old they don't post on there at least I couldn't find it on the on the blogs on their on their website when they post these so this olive oil being evil thing the concern may have been a while ago but it jumped into my friend's head because of this whole coconut thing it appears okay so Let's go to a paper that looked at the high-fat Greek diet, okay? Is, should we all do it? Well, let's first look and see. So here is Crete in Corfu. Uh, and you can see the, the, the consumption total calories from fat. Two methods of analysis. Even the lowest is still higher than most of the low-fat people want. So... So this kind of sticks in their craw, I guess, and you can see, and they, and they don't think clearly. So this goes back right to that Pritikin article that I was linked to. Here's the hype, apparently. Mediterranean diet is heart healthy. It's rich in olive oil, so olive oil must be heart healthy and the key to a longer life. Well, I never really looked at it like that, but clearly what we know is that if up to 43% of caloric intake in the island of Crete, when the studies were done, it was fat, and most of it was olive oil, and they had no heart disease. Certainly can't say that olive oil promotes heart disease. So, what they say, they think this is the hype. The people on Earth with the longest life and least heart disease do not eat diets rich in olive oil or any other fat. Really? Except for the Cretes. They do eat diets rich in whole natural foods, vegetables, fruits, whole grains, and beans. Yeah, but on Crete, they eat a lot of olive oil. So how can you say that olive oil causes disease as you're trying to allege in this article? And you can see how they'll just twist the evidence. It's shocking, actually. So uh, let's look at uh, how what, what also gets in their craw. Anyone who talks about high fat, it just irritates them. So the whole high fat thing is probably the worst way to look at because depending upon where you are on Earth when food was not being shipped around, 
and you are growing it or hunting it or cultivating it to some degree, uh, it was free of sugar, flour, and refined oils. And to Pritikin's credit, they're anti-sugar, flour, and refined oils. They're just anti-all fat. Without a lot of logic, as you'll see in a couple seconds, because this is probably their best evidence, and it's terrible. And guys like this really piss these people off. So this is Stefanson, who lived with the Eskimos. The Arctic Circle natives for years ate the high-fat diet, no vegetables or minimal vegetables. And there was no heart disease up there, healthy people. And they ate like 70, 80% fat, mostly animal fat, therefore saturated fat. So if saturated fat is so terrible from animals, how come these people weren't dropping like flies as opposed to flourishing in the most, in the most violent uh, climate that we have on Earth? It, it's, it's, I mean, it's rather shocking. So it's a worthwhile uh, effort to, 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 to get a copy of Stefanson's book and look through it. And there are articles about him as well. Okay, so to put this in the right context, because this whole fat thing gets people almost like, I don't know, Manchurian candidate eaters. They stop thinking clearly. Nothing is going to benefit someone. You can't give coconut oil or olive oil without changing anything around to people without oposeopathy. So here's Big Daddy on the cash. We talked about him previously. If this guy's living on his hypercaloric diet, high calorie diet, you just can't give him extra calories from olive oil and coconut oil and expect a health benefit. So that needs to be the context of, of this, and it rarely is because people go full tropic thunder, if you know what I'm talking about, and they lose their minds when the topic of fat comes up, and here is the perfect example of it. Let's look at what they say. So getting into this article by Pritikin, Separating the truth from the hype. Nah, they actually promote more hype. So this is what they say. Several human studies have also poked holes in olive oil's heart health claims when researchers from the University of Crete recently compared residents of Crete who had heart disease with residents free of disease. They found that residents with heart disease ate a diet with significantly higher daily intakes of monounsaturated fat from olive oil as well as higher fat intake overall. Well, you'll see how weak this is. I mean, it's weak. But the problem is, you know, my friend who sent it to me didn't click through and look at it. And, there, and I don't know why. It's just, it, gets, it gets just tricky. The whole diet thing is like, I don't know, mesmerizing. P people stop thinking clearly. So about 20, 25, maybe longer years ago, probably 25 years ago, I, 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 uh, learn more about the Mediterranean diet from Artemis Samopoulos. She's probably the, the most famous of the uh, of the omega-3 researchers over the years, writing numerous, numerous articles about it. You can search her, Samopoulos. So uh, I learned about, from her, purslane. So this, you can see right here, is purslane. This is an area uh, uh, on my property where I've got, I let purslane grow when I see it. This, this actually came out when I was cleaning up this little area of, uh, of, of soil. What you see growing here, actually, this is turmeric that's starting to, to pop up. So I've got turmeric growing. I let the purslane grow a little closer view of there's the purslane. Highly edible, and the people on the island of Crete historically ate lots of it. It is one of the most nutritious of our plants. It has probably uh, the highest amount or one of the highest amounts available of anti-inflammatory omega-3 linoalpha linolenic acid that becomes uh, gets converted in small amounts but still does get converted to EPA and DHA what we find in fish oil. So I let the purslane grow wherever I see it. This guy actually came out when I was weeding this thing out. I planted it back and it just grows. It's pretty impressive. So also growing my property you can see this is in a different bed uh, you can see, now these, these are weeds. I'm going to clean these up today, hopefully. But this is ginger growing here. This is ginger growing. So popped up, and it's just strong, robust. Grows fast. Really impressive. Really impressive. Just take the, got organic ginger and turmeric from the local health food store and planted it, and off it goes. So I'm, of course, in Florida with the good climate. So this is all in the spirit of, right, the Pritikin vegetarian approach to things. Don't eat any evil animal products and even avoid coconut oil. Not that I do that, but uh, this is a thing that, that, that a lot of these whole grain, 
grainy acts, the grain wash people think, the beans and legume possessed minds, they think that people who eat meat and cheese and fish and, or meat and cheese and eggs, that that's all we eat. If you eat that, you must just be doing double donkey burgers at some place and just getting 50 pounds of french fries. No, that's not the case. So what else do I have to, to demonstrate my devotions to vegetation? So here you can see three papaya trees. I got more of them. Big old papayas growing. Let's zoom in a little. Oh, here we go. Just so you can see, this is these are uh, uh, moringa that are growing. Got a, It's interesting. The moringa that I seeded out earlier this year, planted one early to see how it would do. It's six feet tall now. These guys are still teeny. Kept them in the pots probably because, I don't know, maybe the, maybe the root was just like, hey, you know, we're in this small place we can't grow. I have no idea. But the one is six feet tall. Really impressive. Let's zoom in. Let's zoom in. Uh, and in the, in the spirit of Italy, here I have what looks like Padre Pio looking over my growing uh, tropical foods. This is a really impressive growth of dragon fruit. Created this little trellis system here, and the dragon fruit's going crazy. So on the other side of the yard, stuff I haven't planted yet. Oh, also, in, uh, in, in Greek, they have fig trees going like crazy. So I got a bunch of fig trees. So here's a fig tree here. Here's a fig tree. There's a fig tree. You can't see it too well. Another fig tree over here. And this guy sticking out right here, actually, is... Actually, the fig tree is right there. There's the fig tree right there. Fig tree. This is chestnut. Another little papaya tree growing. The guy on the street gave it to me. Had, like, no leaf. Now it has a couple big leaves. So what I haven't planted yet are raspberry bushes over here. This is a... A butterfly attracting plant, I forget what it's called, more, more raspberries. Here are more moringas in the plant still that I haven't done. So, you know, lots and lots and lots of vegetation demonstrating that uh, meat-eating people uh, can also eat, eat tons and tons of vegetation, which seems to completely evade the minds of the whole grainy axe, the grain-washed masses that are out there, but in support of them. Look what I even have. I even have... Beans, black beans, legumes, chia seeds, all vegan. Notice they're still, <laughs> they haven't been opened yet because, you know, I'm not going to eat them unless I, unless I need to. little subliminal, not so subliminal. Uh, the most rational approach, I think, where we don't get into blaming foods for this or that and look much more at total caloric intake, avoiding sugar, flour, refined oils, and as in Chapter 9, keeping track of our inflammatory markers. So for those friends of mine who think that I may be... Uh, might be shifting to vegan land. I am not. This is from Memorial Day of 2017. You can see how I eat pizza. I eat the top. So here's your cheese. Here's sausage. You got a little vegetation in there. And we have the vegetation over here. So tons of calories in this, in the, in the dough. Uh, and so by eating the tops, you uh, avoid a bunch of calories that are essentially just flour, useless flour calories. So you eat a small amount or a modest amount of this and then tons of vegetation. What's the problem? There is no problem. There is no problem. And you can you know this is true when you take it to the extreme of the Arctic Eskimo, Stefanson approach, where they ate almost pure fat. So this will also not be paleo, right? Because cheese. So I'm not a paleo guy, but I'm not an anti-paleo guy. I'm just not worried about things, a little bit of cheese. I'm not worried about that. So let's get back to the Pritikin article. Here it is. And here's a paper that they said, remember, recent University of Crete recently looked at this. Oh, and found that uh, heart disease patients ate more olive oil. Therefore, it's not healthy. This is not a rational way of looking at this. This is a grain-washed, fat, anti-fat brainwashed way of looking at olive oil. So here's the paper that they quote. Here is a paper that they quote. Okay, so what was it that they specifically talk about? So University of Crete, again, significantly higher intakes of monos, olive oil, and more fat. So we got to look at, the, at, the, at, at exactly what they did in the paper. So here is the list of stuff. And you know, you got to look at, you have to look at kilojoules converted to calories, and it becomes a little bit annoying. But anyway, look what happens here. You know, we'll, we'll, we'll first... Get a first zoom in a little bit. Actually, I'll get right on to what they talk about. Okay, so what do they say? They say, the Pritikin people say, they have, they eat more fat. 
They eat more total fat than, uh, so here are your controls, free of heart disease. Here are your patients with heart disease. And these heart disease patients are overeating fat, terrible. Look at the difference. 105.5 grams per day, 103.52 grams different. The controls ate two grams, as you should know, of fat is just 18 calories. So the patients with heart disease ate only 18 calories more per day of total fat. Seriously, completely irrelevant. And they ate less calories, 1,000 kilojoules less calories. Then this is about 2,000 roughly calories, a little bit less, 2,000 calories. So they ate less than 2,000 calories per day and had heart disease. Oh, that seems weird. So let's look further. So here is your monos, your monounsaturated fatty acids that you get from olive oil. Look at the difference. Remember what we're told? They ate significantly more. Let's get back. Set the stage, the drama of it all. Significantly higher monos from olive oil, higher fat intake, and they got heart disease. What a joke. 20 calories more, and look at this. 60 grams of mono, mostly from olive oil. 55 grams of mono, mostly from olive oil. Five grams is only 45 calories. So these guys are trying to say that 45 calories, 45 calories more from olive oil causes heart disease. I mean, you just can't get more crazy than this. So going on the same paper, same paper. Now, what did they, what are we looking at here? Uh, first, let's, you, you can see controls. I'm show you what, what, it, what it changed under controls versus your heart disease patients. So in the US, we look at total cholesterol and milligrams per deciliter. So here you can see milligrams per liter. So to get milligrams per deciliter, you gotta get rid of this, you gotta divide by 10. So that's what I did here. Bam, you can see what I'm doing, boom. Now we're at numbers that Americans have uh, on their lab test. So total cholesterol, total cholesterol in the controls, right? People who did not have heart disease, total cholesterol was 230. Total cholesterol for those with heart disease, 207. Now this is median. So this is half. So you have 150 people. So 230 was right in the middle. And then you had 75 people with more, 75 people with less. <laughs> so half the people in this study who did not have, who didn't have heart disease, had cholesterol over 230. Now why aren't they talking about that? Now we're told cholesterol will kill you have to be below 200. Well, half of them were less than 230, but clearly uh, less than 230 does not mean they all jumped down to 150. So the people who were heart disease free had total cholesterol levels that are absolute, absolutely unacceptable to the Pritikin view and the American Heart Association view of total cholesterol. So this, of course, why didn't they talk about this? They didn't. So this tells us that they have to look for a study that's so weak to support their claim that olive oil is bad. So let's go down further. Look at HDL, LDL cholesterol, LDL. We all know everyone wants people with, with to have their LDL like below 100. So <laughs> this is amazing. I mean, it's so funny. So median, this is the middle number. 75 had more than 154 LDL, 75 had less. Well, these people were free of heart disease. It turns out that the people with heart disease had less. The median number was less. Now, half the people had less than 135, half the people had more than 135. But the fact of the matter is that in these two numbers that the American Heart Association and the grain-washed masses and all the rest of the low-fat people talk about the heart disease-free people on the island of Crete had unacceptable levels of total cholesterol and LDL cholesterol, according to that group of what I would call non-thinkers. So right there, you know, they should just throw this thing right out. I mean, they shouldn't even have cited it. Maybe they didn't see it, 
which is probably the most obvious thing because I don't think that the Pritikin people have have any legitimate uh, axe to grind and are promoting ill health. They, they just are, are grainwashed and, and they suffer from fat propaganda, it appears. So what else are we not told by the Pritikin people who are saying that this study, which is about homocysteine, nothing to do about LDL cholesterol, which they make it about LDL and monounsaturated fatty acids. What else should we know about this study? Well, uh, and what else do you think might cause heart disease compared to more in the you know, so a heart disease population who ate less calories and had lower total cholesterol, lower LDL? What else about these people? Well, you know, we, we all know that smoking is a big issue. And a lot of people in Europe still smoke like fiends compared to Americans. So this is from the exact same paper. Turns out that almost half, almost half of the patients with heart disease were smokers. And slightly over 25% without heart disease were smokers in the control group. So maybe that's what it is. Maybe that's what it is. But notice that Pritikin mentioned nothing about this at all causing my friend to have olive oil fear. So this is, uh, you, you can go into the PDF of, the, of this paper and search smoking, and then this, you see this pattern, by the way, they're looking at the pattern of low HDL, elevated triglycerides, seems to be the lipid pattern of heart disease patients in this area, so there may be a genetic thing. And so here, and then they basically confirm it here, HDL cholesterol, APOA, and lipoprotein A, lipoprotein A is probably the more, one of the more atherogenic lipoproteins, are not directly diet dependent. So you got genetic factors there. And finally, finally, not mentioned uh, by the Pritikin article, the incidence of smoking was higher among ischemic heart disease patients and controls. The harmful effects of smoking on HDL and triglycerides are well known. Completely not mentioned at all by Pritikin, also not mentioned in, in this paper, also not mentioned in this paper uh, is the following. So this is the conclusion. This is the conclusion in the paper. To conclude, the present day suggests ischemic heart disease patients, so heart, heart disease patients in Crete should be encouraged to increase their daily intakes of fiber, folate, omega-3s, no mention of olive oil, and no mention of LDL and olive oil, monounsaturated fatty acids, uh, in this article as suggested by the Pritikin people. But have no fear. It doesn't make any difference. We'll, we'll ignore all this. And here's Pritikin. Bottom line, LDL, still bad. Where's the evidence? They never tell you that oxidized LDL is the problem and normal LDL is not. That would destroy their argument. So continuing on in, with, the, with the Pritikin uh, blog post that my friend sent me, so here's what they, what they do. Let's look closely here. We'll zoom in. A study published recently, Journal of American College of Cardiology, also found that dilation was worse. This means the relaxation, the widening of blood vessels. After 24 people, 12 healthy, 12 with high cholesterol levels, consumed olive oil. Okay, well, what was the context of this? Five teaspoons of olive oil. Now, how many of you would just swallow <laughs> that much olive oil? Anyway, five teaspoons of olive oil swallowed after salami and cheese meals did not help arteries relax or exp and expand. Okay, is this true or are they skipping something? You always got to check because when you have an ax to grind, either via, via being an evil person or, or a paid person, a shill, or... Uh, being brainwashed. You, you have to look at it because you never know what these guys because they're just like so anti, you know, olive oil. I mean, it's madness. So this is what they tell us again. Five teaspoons of olive oil swallowed after salami and cheese did not help. So let's go right to the paper that they're talking about. Bam, there it is. Cute effects of high fat meals enriched with walnuts or olive oil on postprandial endothelial function. So let's look at what they did here. What they actually eat? Well, they ate 1,200 calories, 1,200 calories, 1,200 calories in one sit down. <laughs> That's enough for the average female in America who wants to stay, wants to lose weight and stay trim and fit, at least from a, from a dietary perspective. And you know, 
1,500, 700 calories for a guy. So, so imagine if you're a guy and you're trying to like shred 1,200 calories, all you have left for the rest of the day is no more than 600 calories. That's it. Maybe less, maybe just 300 if you're really trying to cut some adipose tissue down. So this is an enormous amount of calories to swallow down in one meal. And this is how goofy some of these studies are. So remember that Pritikin said that it was just salami and cheese. See, they forgot to rec uh, uh, state in the Pritikin, or they did on purpose, 100 grams of white bread, 75 grams of salami, 50 grams of fatty cheese. To top it off, 125 grams of fat-rich yogurt. And on top of this, they added uh, olive oil or walnut. Now, the thing about this that's important to, to, to focus on is that the walnut would be the only source of omega-3 fatty acids. There's virtually no omega-3s in this deal here. You got omega-3s here. This is your alpha linolenic acid that's also rich. Uh, yeah, you'll find a high concentration as relative to other vegetables in purslane, also consumed, also consumed uh, in Crete. So let's look at what they did in this study. 1,200 calories, just to make it really clear, 1,200 calories in one shot. They got it from 100 grams of white bread, salami, cheese, fat-rich yogurt. How many of you guys do that on a regular basis? I mean, some do. No one listening to this does, most, most likely, unless you're freaked out. So on top of that, they added, what they did is they just sopped the white bread with all this olive oil and then ate it. 1,200 calories. So you can see that Pritikin, the Pritikin article mentioned none of this. They didn't put it in the right context. And the context for it to be put in is what is, are Americans adding their olive oil, coconut oil, whatever to? What are we adding it to? And we go back to these 2010 guidelines. We know that the average American is following the mandate from 1919. Eat your cookies, bread, and milk as your simple suppers. 100 years later, almost 100 years later, uh, that's what we are complying. We are complying with the mandate. And then on top of all this, slopping on salad dressing onto virtually no uh, vegetable calories. So you can see a bit of a misrepresentation of the facts here. And to complicate it more, if you were confused by this, and this shouldn't be confusing because this is just an inaccurate assessment of the papers. They, are, they have an anti-fat position that they are defending. And so they're going to defend it. The American Heart Association is going to have an anti-fat position also. They, it took them years to, to subtly uh, get rid of their pro-margarine stance. So you'll find papers like this too. This is just published literally yesterday. I saw this on Medscape. Olive oil. Is it the key ingredient in Alzheimer's prevention? <laughs> uh, the study conducted by investigators at Temple University in Philadelphia suggests that olive oil component of the Medi a Mediterranean diet promotes healthy brain aging. Now, just so that you know, I don't look at it like this. I look at it like this. We should stop eating sugar, flour, refined oil, calories. We see down below here. E overeating these creates the flame, promotes most chronic diseases. We want to replace those calories with vegetation. And olive oil and coconut oil can be part of this vegetation calorie increase without fear, so long as we are keeping track of our markers properly, as outlined in Chapter 9 of the Deep Flame Diet Book.